electron microscope system with the EDAX uh, system attached to it, built right in. EDAX allows us to look at chemical elements. My name is Dr. Stephen E. Jones. I decided early on that I'd rather stick with science and the facts. And that's what I do. That's what I've done all my life. I have worked in other areas like fusion, where it takes years and years to accumulate evidence to prove your point. When we say scientific proof, it's hard to come by in science, but I think we're very close to it. Other than 9-11, there have been no high-rise steel frame buildings anywhere ever, except that one day, that have fallen uh, due to fire. And on that day, therefore, I, I challenge the official story that fire alone is the central cause. I appreciate it when people react and they say, well, you know, scientifically, how about somebody else's explanation for free fall speed? But if you just say you're a nutty heretic, you know, then I say, well, no, I'm not. I love to teach and to interact with students. As you think about it, the forces up and down are equal, third law, okay. Secondly, I did have some teaching awards from BYU, Al Kuen, which is one of the prestigious awards for teaching, and the Brigham Award as well. I've taught this principle through the years and I've noticed that some students have a hard time grasping them. Those forces are really equal. I've taught for over uh, 21 years. So the force up is causing a lot of damage. That's something I really enjoy. Here's what I see, uh, Brett. What I, what I see is that these powers that be use crises to get people to do things that ordinarily people wouldn't do, like 9-11. But was it real? Just, you know, Muslim terrorists, or is there more to it? My concern about 9-11 stems from scientific research. In fact, the evidence shows very strongly that there were explosives used in the way the buildings came down. That is the completeness of the destruction. The rapid acceleration. the symmetry. All of these things argue for uh, controlled demolition using explosives. If you look at controlled demolition using explosives, The roof line does fall at nearly free fall speed, and this, the trick is to use explosives to get the material out of the way, so then the roof line will come straight down and <clears throat> land on the footprint. In the spring of 2005, I attended a talk by a local speaker. She said, if you think those towers came down just because they were hit by jets, you have some major surprises ahead of you. And about half the audience started applauding, and I was, uh, of the other half, kind of wondering what in the world she was talking about. <laughs> I, I hadn't really given this uh, 
much thought. But in the next day or two, I sat down at my computer and started searching, and I found there was quite a lot of research that had been done, in particular the collapse of World Trade Center 7, which until that time, spring of 2005, I had not even seen the collapse of World Trade Center 7. It's a building that was not even hit by a jet. Building 7 ablaze at the moment and apparently getting ready to collapse. How can this be? That comes straight down completely and onto its footprint. Never hit by a jet. How could this be? And then late afternoon, still another building collapses. Seven World Trade Center, ruined by falling debris from the Twin Towers. It really was uh, watching the collapse of Building 7 for the first time that got me interested it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to see that there's something very strange, especially when you compare with controlled demolition, you get those side by side. Yeah, they, they really look uh, very much the same. The towers and the World Trade Center 7, they were reduced to rubble. It's not like just a piece sloughed off or the building came down and stopped or something. You have rubble and pulverization and there's not much standing. So how do you explain this? Bizant came up with this idea. And in his paper, he says, well, there's this upper block of floors. It remains basically intact. And it's like this big piston or tamper that, that just wipes out the floors below. We've written a response. And our point was, how about Newton's third law? If you have a force down, there has to be an equal and opposite force up. That's Newton's third law. It's one of the fundamental laws of physics and mechanics and structural engineering. So if there's a force on the building below, the building below exerts a force upward on this block, you see. So what happens now when you have these equal forces is, sure, you get destruction, but you get destruction both ways. If, for instance, the North Tower, you look at that upper block and it's being demolished, just as you expect from the third law, really. I mean, you get both ways, but it's weaker above, so you expect that upper block to be demolished. That's what happens if you look at it. I mean, does anyone look at the data? I mean, do we just pull some idea out of the blue and say, well, uh, this is how it happened? No. We say, no, I, I want to see data. I want you to explain to me how your explanation fits the data. And if it doesn't fit the data, I I'm going to throw it out. I'm a scientist. That's what I do. Not because it's politically correct or incorrect. I don't care about that. It, your explanation has to fit the data. That's what I like, data and correspondence with explanations. The next thing then that I started looking at was writing up a paper, summarizing these things, providing references, trying to then uh, put this together in a coherent scientific study. And uh, interesting um, that I had a Deseret News reporter contact me right away about the paper. A physics professor with a controversial September 11th conspiracy theory Dr. Stephen Jones thinks explosives may have been set in the Trade Center towers, bringing them down. They're sticking with this one hypothesis. It's almost they have blinders on. It's got to be fires and damage. The and researcher so raised the hypothesis of explosives set in buildings and asked why World Trade Center 7 came down in just seconds, hours after the attacks. The reaction was, uh, was uh, generally negative locally. You know, <laughs> of course, on email I was uh, called a kook, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, it's really quite remarkable, really. What did they call me? Um, oh, all sorts of names. I'm probably in polite company. I wouldn't repeat them. I want to read you a quote from the Deseret Morning News, a paper in Utah <clears throat> from you. I'm quoting now. It is quite plausible that explosives were pre-planted in all three buildings and set off after the two plane crashes, which were actually a diversion tactic. Muslims are probably right. not to blame for bringing down the World Trade Center buildings after all. That's, right. I would think, so, pretty offensive to a lot of people listening. Do you have any evidence for that? I mean, well, uh, uh, not, not to the Muslims, I might say. <laughs> when I was on the Tucker Carlson show, shortly after my paper came out, they had me staring at a camera 
I wasn't able, there was no monitor that I could watch, but uh, the staff had asked me what, what I'd like to show, and I said, well, I, wanna, I want you to show the fall of uh, Building 7. I would like to do a little experiment with you, Tucker, if I could. I sent out a, uh, a video clip of the collapse of Building 7 because most people haven't actually seen that one, and that's the, that's the crux of the argument okay. that I'm well, presenting. Okay, sum so. up very quickly the argument for us. And I fully expected they would. They didn't uh, say they wouldn't until the show. Now, do you, I can't see what you're seeing, so we, we just, are you we rolling just see that? The, no, we just see the building. I kept talking about Building 7, and finally I asked, uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Carlson, are you going to show the collapse of Building 7? He said no. But I'm, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I really want to do this experiment okay. with you well, to look at the We don't have a lot of time of for experiments, uh, Professor, but if you could just well, uh, just give us one thing to hold on to. How, wh you make this, these claims or appear to make these claims. Do you have any uh, evidence look, uh, that there Tucker, were bombs in the building? The, sure, sure. Let's start with the uh, collapse of Building 7. Can you roll the video clip that I sent to you? Okay, I'm not sure uh, if we that, can, but to specify... Maybe there's some kind of uh, code. You just don't show the collapse of Building 7. I don't know what it is. And if you look at the collapse, you see uh, what I've studied is the fall time, the symmetry, the fact that it first uh, dips in the middle. That's called the kink, which is uh, very characteristic, of course, All right. of uh, uh, controlled pro demolition. Pro professor, I am sorry that we are out of time, and I, I'm not sure that Whoa. Uh, you've uh, One other thing I want to mention okay, about... Okay, if you can hit it, uh, hit okay. with it quickly. Okay, All right. You know, you have to go with science, I figure. And uh, science tells us that buildings don't just collapse under their footprint at free fault speed unless you get the material out of the way. I've been speaking with Dr. Stephen Jones, author of the scientific paper, Why Indeed Did the World Trade Center Buildings Collapse? This society is mesmerized by this myth, this official story of 9-11 being due to the Muslims, everyone knows it. You can't challenge this myth. If you do, you're a conspiracy kook. Well, I'm sorry, good science cuts through all that nonsense. It doesn't care. When I analyze these samples of previously molten metal, it doesn't care whether I'm conservative or liberal, Republican, Democrat, Green, it doesn't care. It's just an experiment that's done, it's objective. To have people just say, I don't want to see the data. I, I, I don't want you to challenge the official story, which everyone knows, you know. That, that is just so contrary to science, to logic, to reason, to humanity. How do you respond to people that might say, this is just so far-fetched, it can't possibly be true? Well, see, again, that, that argument is very general, far-fetched. I mean, I'm giving solid, concrete uh, evidence this is state-of-the-art equipment here. Uh, you know, if you, can, if you can give me an argument why, uh, it, what, is the scanning electron microscope, is that far-fetched? No. Is EDS far-fetched? It's used worldwide, and uh, no, it's not far-fetched. So what, what's far-fetched? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Tell me, is this far-fetched? To, to make comparisons between residues from thermite and residues found in the World Trade Center? No, that's just science. The goal tonight I have in mind is to preserve constitutional law in the United States. Now, I love America and I love the Constitution. I uh, maintain that we are engaged in a struggle for liberty and truth right now. Someone, my, my uh, exemplar actually said, the truth shall make you free. Right. So let's see if we can get some truth going, shall we? Here we go. Look at the size of these columns huge, interconnected. I had an email from a mechanical engineer who read my paper and agrees with me and uh, sent me this photo of a stove. Anyway, when we burn, okay, organic materials, we uh, don't expect the uh, stove to collapse. You know, it can stand. <laughs> <All right. laughs> now, and, and she got a laugh too. And I thought, I thought that's, she's made a good point there. And then she says, so far, I've not been called the dean's office or chair's office for covering this material. I cannot make that same statement. <clears throat> okay, more. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, they were kind. They said I could go ahead with the investigation and please give academic seminars and write papers. And that's what we're doing tonight.
Hmm? It's okay. Let's see, it's not that BYU is trying to shut me up, okay? I get that, that's not the case. definitely uh, interesting to talk to other people, you know, especially when they find out that my dad's the one doing a lot of this 9-11 research. That's, uh, that's an easy end to a lot of groups that are, <laughs> or, uh, for a lot of people that uh, have noticed things are, are kind of funny with that. And I guess my opinion even from the beginning is, um, of course there are a lot of conspiracy theories that surround 9-11, but there are a number of things that are just plain obvious too about it. Even if there was enough energy from the fires burning to to weaken the columns or, or, or whatever, you know, NIST said happened. Um, the idea that it would happen in such a uniform way that it would fail all at the same time, all the way across the building, is a little bit silly. There's some discussion in the family about, you know, concern that he's doing something that will be dangerous for everyone or, um, or even just dangerous to him. As far as something, you know, someone who was involved with this going after him um, certainly could happen, but hasn't yet. Uh, there was uh, one fellow just very soon after my paper became available that wrote to me uh, with uh, uh, threats, actually. And um, he said that what's at stake here is more important than any one man's career and I'm pretty sure he's referring to my career. He also said that the pain involved in taking my paper offline would be much less than the pain that would follow if my paper were published. He said that uh, my research uh, challenging the official story would in endanger people. They use the term endangerment. There are three groups of people that can do great harm. Those that are intentional adversaries, people that want to destroy our country. There are groups that intentionally aid adversaries, which would be considered traitors. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another group, however, that has good intention, may have good intentions, but may aid an adversary. He said, basically, I can't tell you too much, but the fact is these buildings did come down by fire, and if that became known, then terrorists would be emboldened to use fire methods on more buildings to bring them down. A, a classic example is one professor believed that a certain reaction would uh, cause columns to fail. And so he was publishing uh, combinations of chemicals that would do this. Now when I started talking about thermite, he said, you must not talk about thermite. Again, this could endanger people because um, thermite could be used by terrorists. And I responded, and he threatened me with a lawsuit. You know, that's, you're way beyond the, what you should do. If you believe that that is really a successful way of attacking a building, you know, we shouldn't be giving people ideas of how to do that. That's, that's not an appropriate behavior. And I said, well, um, you're going to find ways to easily purchase this stuff. Lots of information's out there. It's not secret <laughs> at all. So it just, again, it made no sense. In the industry that I worked in, the nuclear weapon industry, by law, you can't talk about the details of that. If we revealed how we make nuclear weapons, then an adversary could maybe use that information to, to use it against us. The other reason is if we discussed the vulnerabilities, somebody may be able to find a way to defeat our system that we hadn't thought about. And either way, society can suffer. So we just need to be very, very careful that we, uh, that we don't do something really dumb in the name of science or any other name. You know, we need to, we need to think about how we serve society. And our service to society is more important than what kind of name we make for ourselves, for example. How does it endanger people to say that explosives were the cause if explosives were not the cause, which was what he was arguing? So I, I, his logic just made no sense, but he used that uh, very persuasively. Fire is the official story. That's the gist of it. 
at all. The terrorists know that. And <clears throat> so if the official story is true, then the official story is what's endangering people because they're saying that fire can result in a collapse of building and loss of lives. Whereas my hypothesis is that fire can't do that. So anyway, he also then, after the threats didn't work, he offered some bribes and uh, he gave me two ideas for grants that he said he could almost promise would be funded by Homeland Security. Anyway, I wasn't interested in his bribe offers. Bo both of them had to do with fires being the causative agent for the collapse of the buildings and I would have to change research directions. He made that clear. And then I'd get all this money. Not attractive to me at all. <laughs> oh my. He also said, I have learned to appreciate the value of silence, even in the face of superior data. So he admitted my data was pretty good after some discussion. But he said, still, I have learned to appreciate the value of silence. Watching ABC 4 News at 5, close to home. Good evening, everyone. A BYU professor is under investigation by the university for his controversial and some say flat out crazy theories about the attacks on the World Trade Center five years ago. Dr. Stephen Jones is on paid administrative leave for what BYU officials call increasingly inflammatory accusations. I was uh, put on administrative leave, which indeed was painful. Um, and a little bit surprising, I must say. So, uh, uh, I mean, there wasn't much said to me. Brian, why is BYU taking action against his statements? For a couple of reasons, Mark. First, what Jones has said, and second, what the university suspects he has not done with his research. We are concerned about the increasing number of accusatory and speculative comments being made by Dr. Jones regarding the collapse of the World Trade Center. And the second involves a concern that Dr. Jones' work on this topic has not been published in an appropriate scientific venue. Dr. Jones has been at the BYU Department of Physics for 21 years. His office is right around the corner here. He still has lab privileges. He's still getting paid, but for now at least, he can't teach. I, I do regret that when they uh, did this, they did not inform me so that, you know, maybe let, let me teach a couple more classes or, I can never understand why I couldn't teach. It didn't make sense to me. <laughs> I mean, I was teaching physics, you know, what uh, could be wrong with that. But anyway, um, so it was. And, um, what was your reaction when he was placed on paid leave? Um, you know, I thought that was interesting that they would take that step. But, I mean, I guess that says uh, as much about uh, the administration at BYU as it does about him. Evidently, there are some people that have influence over them, and there wasn't much that he could do about it. There's a certain religious aspect to that as well, because the LDS church basically owns and doesn't, I guess, directly operate it, but you know, they appoint the, the board of directors and those who do operate the university. A lot of people tend to think of them, or any decision that they make, as some sort of uh, thing directed by God. And if anything, you know, that may have caused more concern and disruption in the family than uh, in the actual financial aspects and other things. To what degree does the university believe Dr. Jones may be casting in an unfavorable light on the LDS Church. It is concern whenever the uh, uh, professor brings the university into um, their personal concerns. I don't think, you know, God really had anything to do with it. <laughs> They're just people. They were influenced by other people. And no one knows exactly what those pressures were, but they made a decision and did it.
So he's being investigated by the university. What, what exactly are they looking for? Well, what, part, part, when you get to say things, when you get to be a professor, you have to back your uh, theories up with uh, peer-reviewed papers. So what they want to do is they want to go back through the papers and see if there is some scientific evidence behind them, if there are others in his field that say, yes, indeed, these are true. And if not, ah. All of my papers on 9-11 have been thoroughly peer-reviewed. I wouldn't have it any other way. I requested uh, a further review. This is in the media. I wanted that. And unfortunately, that did not come through. <laughs> I am glad that in the physics class that very day when I was informed, I had had an opportunity as I look back. I just felt like telling the students some of the things of my, of my heart and my uh, broader interest and experience. Not 9-11 particularly, but my uh, sense of of love and concern for the students, which is unusual except on maybe the last day of class. Turned out it was my last class. A Brigham Young University professor known for his theory about the 9-11 terror attacks is now leaving the school. The BYU professor suspended for his beliefs about the 9-11 attacks has announced his retirement. In a statement, Dr. Jones said, I am electing to retire so that I can spend more time speaking and conducting research of my choosing. I appreciate the wonderful opportunity I've had to teach and serve and do research at BYU for more than 21 years. It's a very difficult decision. And I'm not even sure it was you know, the best decision, but the way I look at it is the folks at the university have a certain stewardship. And I have a stewardship for pursuing truth scientifically as the primary method, using the scientific method, experiments and analysis. So I wanted to pursue that with regard to 9-11. And I couldn't see why I shouldn't, nor did anyone explain to me why I shouldn't. With Dr. Jones' resignation, BYU is dropping its review of his statements. Jones says he will continue with research of his own choosing and says after thorough study and reflection, he judges the Iraq war as a war of aggression founded on what he calls deception. When I was placed on administrative leave, of course that was very uh, shocking, but I decided that I really wanted to get to the bottom of this, about what happened on 9-11. <laughs> I wasn't about to give up. It occurred to me that if we looked in the World Trade Center dust, that we should be able to see some residue from the uh, explosive. We saw those clouds of dust formed as the buildings came down. In my first paper, I requested samples of the, of the dust that was generated. If we could just get a sample collected on the day of 9-11, before there had been any cleanup, then we could rule out these arguments that, oh, your dust is just contaminated because of the cleanup. On the morning of September 11th, I was heading to the Brooklyn Bridge. I proceeded to start walking on the bridge towards Manhattan. I had a camera, so I just started taking a lot of pictures. In the photos, you could see also my take on the people. They were sort of nervous, uh, scared. They were sort of a little freaked out. When I reached the middle of the bridge, um, I started to hear this rumbling beneath my feet, a lot of vibration. Then I noticed the uh, second tower began to fall. A big rush of soot and debris came our way.
after the film, the debris made a clearing. I uh, began to finish walking towards Manhattan. And when I got to maybe this point, um, there's sort of people sort of running around the highway over here. This is where the, the gate where I just cross, and I, I'm guessing I picked up a sample somewhere between the, you know, of this angle, from that rail to the end of the rail, before the concrete starts. Everyone was sort of like hitting it and pushing it off and stuff like that. And so I just, uh, towards the end, I just sort of grabbed just a handful and uh, walked up north with it. Did you have any sort of feeling you picked up the dust? Like, I mean, what, what made you do it? What made, what made what made, everyone asked me that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been answering like, you know, for history. I mean, I didn't really have like a reason why I picked up the... So I like to call it soot instead of dust. Um, yeah, I don't really have a, you know, I just scooped it up and kept it. He, he got to my door. He was standing there all covered in dust. And he pulled out his hand. He says, this, look, this stuff's all over the place down there. And it was shocking to see him covered in dust. And I just remember looking around and thinking, well, let's just put it in a plastic bag. The sample itself is pretty toxic. You could tell that it's just got a lot of chemicals in it. It, it kind of seeps something that's sort of like a cross between a dust and a gas. And it's like a blue-green mist, just very fine, fine dust. We heard that there was this BYU physicist who was testing the dust samples. And, you know, I just assumed that there was plenty of People, there were plenty of people with dust samples. It was Tom Breidenbach, I remember now, uh, who wrote me, and it would have been an email, and said that, that uh, he and his friend had saved this sample from the very day 9-11, <clears throat> before noon on that day, you know. <laughs> I was very excited. I, I debated about whether or not to volunteer the sample. I, I didn't really want to maybe even face up to what the sample might show myself. So I didn't, we didn't, I did, it took maybe a couple months before I actually sent the sample in. Well, this is pristine. It cannot be contaminated due to cleanup operations, which began much later. Even as the dust was settling and he collected it, he held in his hand the secret of what made those buildings come down. As I looked at the dust, I noticed some spheres. I was not expecting that at all, but some spheres that were just visible to the eye. And then I looked at those with uh, electron microscope uh, using uh, elemental analysis called X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy. And there we found that there was a lot of iron in these spheres. And I realized that a magnet then could pull these iron-rich spheres out of the dust so we could look at more of them. I remember Dr. Ferrer of BYU and I looked at this sample together. Um, I like to do this in a fume hood just because it's fairly uncluttered and also who knows what's in this dust. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not real impressed with this magnet, but <laughs> I mean the looks of it. It happens to be a very strong magnet and uh, invariably you pick up all the other junk along with the magnetic materials. So that's why you have to sort of visually go through it with tweezers and inspect it and pick out and manually pick out the particles with tweezers. Using a magnet, we're able to find very large numbers of these spheres. Some you can see with your naked eye and more you could see with the optical microscope and then many, many more you could see with the electron microscope. And many of these are aluminum and iron together in the sphere, a very unusual combination. The only way I've been able to duplicate that particular combination is with uh, thermite. The essence of thermite is a reaction between aluminum metal and iron oxide, very finely ground. And when they react, you get 
aluminum oxide and iron, molten iron, but sometimes the aluminum oxide will get trapped with the iron. And of course, it's hot enough that the, these are molten, so as it sprays into the air, you get droplets. And these will contain iron and aluminum will be caught in there too. And that's just what we see in these spheres, a lot of them, uh, matching what we get from the thermitic reaction. And then we looked a little further at the dust and I noticed there's also another type of particle in there. And this is what I call a red-gray chip. I started looking at the chips because they were distinctive. Red on one side, gray on the other. Okay, so I'm looking mostly for the red chips because the red chips we find uh, to be most interesting as far as the chemistry and also in the calorimeter. It's sort of, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack almost because there's so much dust. This is kind of hard because you're going through this thing. You can't really tell where your tweezers are. And that's about as big as we're going to get. So in terms of millimeters, that the red chip is about, a, um, it's close to a millimeter long, but it's uh, maybe a quarter millimeter wide. The way that I first heard about this issue um, from Steve, I actually read his paper in 2005. Even after reading the paper, uh, it took a few days to sort of absorb it and really let it sink in and um, get over some of the, uh, what would you call it, uh, the implications of what that paper was saying. Once I was able to get over those implications and sort of say, okay, forget the implications for now and just look at the science. And once I did that, I started saying, okay, these, there are a lot of questions that need to be addressed. And then I actually met Steve Jones on campus and I told him, I said, look, if, if you would like some, uh, a collaborator or if you would like uh, me to help with some work, I told him what my skills were, I told him the type of facilities that we had in the lab and, uh, and of course he, him being at BYU, he would have full access to those facilities. So uh, that's how we got started. Initially, when I saw these red-gray chips, I, I looked at them just because they were unusual. I didn't have any guess as to what they might be. He told me about the red-gray chips, and, and I was mildly interested in the red-gray chips. I didn't think anything of them. Um, but the, the number that he was finding of these red chips made me think that perhaps they were significant. And then I explored the nature of these chips using the, the electron microscope system. And sure enough, they contain the thermitic material, namely iron, oxide, aluminum. And silicon and carbon are quite common. In fact, the, <clears throat> the fine grain of it is so fine that I would call this a nanothermite material. At some point, we were talking about these chips, and at some point, I suggested, look, if these, if these chips really are of an explosive nature or, or um, an incendiary of some type, then all it would take would be to put one of these things in a calorimeter and see what kind of energy we got out as we heated them up. I know they're energetic, so there's no question about that. I mean, the calorimeter's not going to lie to us. As my materials uh, scientist friend said, they blow up. We found that the energy release is very rapid, so it gives you a very narrow spike in the machine. We compared our spike that we got with uh, a spike from known nanothermite, which is produced at a military laboratory. Their measured energy released with known nanothermite was less than these red-gray chips. We captured the residue after the material had been heated. The red-gray chips, as we ignite them, produce spheres that have iron and aluminum, just like we see in the dust in abundance. So now we have um, an explanation, or at least a correspondence, from what we see in the dust after the reaction of the red chips and before. 
So, I mean, everything just click, 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 fit together. It's very exciting, uh, really, from a scientific point of view. When you put all that data together, then you, you, you obviously will can draw your own conclusions, but the conclusion that we drew, which I think is a very good one, is that these chips, uh, these chips are energetic. I mean, these chips have something to do, I mean, they're, they're like an incendiary. This uh, pyrotechnic explosive material should not be in the World Trade Center dust, particularly in these large quantities. I mean, there are people in these buildings. Well, what are these tons of explosives doing in there? Unless somebody really wanted those buildings to come down completely. Steve didn't know what he was looking for when he first started looking through the dust. And we didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't know what we would find. You know, we're, we're doing this on a shoestring. And, and, I mean, we're being supported exclusively by private individuals. We did what we could with what we had. Um, obviously, you can always question that. And all the stuff that we've done can be reproduced. I was a little bit surprised and disappointed that... Um, there weren't more people that wanted to try to reproduce the work. It's kind of funny, these guys sit back and sort of take pot shots, but we're the ones doing the experiments. We're in the lab. You know, we're doing the tests. And we're finding out that there's a lot more to 9-11 than just Al-Qaeda hijackers hitting the buildings. I'm not trying to blame anybody or accuse anybody of anything. I just think that we need to continue looking at this. I don't think it's done. I don't think we've answered all the questions. I know we haven't answered all the questions because people are still asking them. And the, those that were part of the official investigation, they, they actually did what they said they were going to do. And they did what they were mandated to do. The problem is the mandate didn't go far enough. It needed to run the full, uh, you know, the full investigation, find out everything about what happened that day. Everything. Not just, okay, tell us how these buildings could have possibly collapsed. Um, and, and don't look at anything else. These are some of my physics texts going way back. Let's get right books here. It was tough. Several years ago, I was a you know, Republican. You know, count me, I'm a Republican. And shopping, yes, I shop, and you know, <laughs> I don't do those things anymore. I'm not a Republican anymore. I, I just think we have to educate people <laughs> and to say, wait a minute. And when there's a crisis announced or promulgated, let's look at the crisis, make sure it's real and not just promulgated. First of all. And second of all, let's look at the solution. And if we stand up together, I think we can say, well, we're not going to be fried. Like that, the guy that threatened my career. Um, I say, well, you know, I'm not going to let that phase me. I'm going to still pursue the truth. But you know, I really enjoyed uh, <clears throat> teaching here. Teaching the students has been great. The students are actually very supportive of research, even 9-11 research. I mean, a lot of them were getting interested. That may have been part of my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Students getting interested. It's the mentality of trusting the government that we've got to get away from. The guys who create the crisis are not going to solve it for you in a way that's going to lead to freedom. I guess that's enough on that.
That's what I like. Data.